The history of the black community as they journeyed and settled in central Ohio is packed with stories of hardship, hope, and resilience. In today's show, we wanted to explore a few of these stories beginning with the Great Migration, which was a mass exodus of African Americans from the South to northern cities like Columbus in the late 1800s. They were motivated by opportunities for economic and political advancement. Here's that history. The spirituals are primarily religious folk songs. They were birthed out of slavery. There were many different types of spirituals. They were used as praise songs. They were used um, as songs of communication. The texts primarily were biblical text, and they chose biblical text because of the Israelites in the Old Testament who were also an enslaved people. And they believed that if the God of the Israelites could deliver them, that that same God could deliver them as well. Throughout the 1800s, African-American settlements dotted Columbus with names like Peter's Run, Oak Woods, and Mudsack. There are a number of small African-American settlements all around central Ohio. A lot of them seem to be located around the Olentangy River. Some have names and some don't. So you had pockets all over the city. And that's what's unique about Columbus, that you had 10, 12 different little hamlets of Afro-American communities. Unreliable census numbers don't give us the whole picture, but what is known is that the African-American population started to swell during the South's turbulent reconstruction years after the Civil War. The intense segregation, the fact that people literally couldn't even be comfortable walking downtown or shopping or even attending church in their home community. Then there were issues like the political disenfranchisement that people literally could not vote and the lack of economic opportunities. And then we look at issues like lynching. So people who did try to fight back within their community were literally killed for their efforts. And then later terrorist groups like the Ku Klux Klan, which is, after all, a terrorist group, helped to keep people in their place. So the refugees who are coming north then after Reconstruction will be African Americans. The African American migration from the South to the North really represents one of the greatest internal mass migrations in world history. When the migration came along, it came because people needed a sense of hope. They needed a sense of safety. We're talking over over six million people who literally voted with their feet, who literally said, we aren't gonna stay where we are because we know that there's some place better we can be. As African Americans began to migrate north, they were coming north because the north was the promised land. You'd often heard in the spirituals, they talked about getting to the promised land. They leave at the rate of 500 a day and 15,000 a month. And so by the time the 1930 has come, one third of Alabama's black population is living north already. And that's just Alabama. It really is more, I'm, I'm seeking freedom, I'm seeking economic ability, I'm seeking a safety, very much like the refugees we see today. We were Americans. We still are Americans. This is our country. We fled within our own country. That's unbelievable. While Jim Crow laws pushed, the promise of steady work pulled. 
And they could move from a, a working class to a middle class status within a lifetime. That was unique and almost unheard of for many Southern communities. And so part of the pull factor facilitating that was the role of the unions. And they had what were called the labor agents who went through various communities in the South advising people of particular economic opportunities, the cities they should go to, and the communities where they could live. My father came from Tennessee. The only way he escaped Tennessee, he couldn't go beyond the seventh grade because they wouldn't let you get an education beyond there, was join the military. From the military, he got to Ohio. That's the only way he got out of Tennessee. The African-American settlements swelled in population, civic groups, and churches responded by locating housing and health care for the new arrivals. It's a part of our DNA that when we moved to communities, it was a community. We cared for one another. We looked after one another. Over the years, settlements came and went with little evidence that they ever existed. Some come to us in photographs, others are gone. The settlements are still a part of the fiber of the city. They all served a purpose. Once that purpose faded, when industry moved or circumstances, then we've lost those. Like, there's no sense that there was ever an Afro-American community in Hilliard. People moved, moved on. But one settlement survived and thrived. The Near East Side becomes really probably the heart and soul of what we think of as the African American community. Because whether you're rich or you're poor, that's where you're going to live. And so it is. It's a city within a city. By the 1930s, parts of it will take the term Bronzeville. Some residents still refer to the King Lincoln District by Bronzeville, still remember its mayors and political power at City Hall and still mourn the raising of the Blackberry Patch to make way for Poindexter Village and the social strife that followed. One pushback of the Great Migration came in the form of neighborhood covenants that restricted the sale of real estate to minorities, to the Irish, the Italians, and African Americans. Uh, ads for, for, for houses, for sale, or for rent, they specified no color, okay, meaning no African Americans. And so we know that there was redlining so that there were areas where African Americans could not purchase a home. The last thing you want to do in some people's minds is see them popping up in your neighborhood. And so there are restrictive covenants that come in that say you cannot sell to Italians, you cannot sell to African Americans, and that goes with the deed of your property. My dad had signed the papers because he was a very fair Afro-American. And by the time they had to get uh, signatures for my mom, it was too late. But they had not intended to sell to an Afro-American. The Great Migration lasted from 1910 to the 1970s, and the push and pull of immigrants both south to the north and east to the west left a unique settlement pattern different than other Midwestern cities. Columbus has never had a full-fledged ghetto, if you will, where the majority of African Americans resided as existed in Cleveland and to some extent in, in Cincinnati. Other historians have noted that one of the reasons why Columbus does not have the racial conflict at that time that others do is because at no part of the city are there more than 30% African American or any dominant ethnic group. And so because they're diffuse, it is not that armed racial conflict that you might be seeing in, in other places. I think the greatest impact of the great migration from the South to the North of African Americans is to open up more doors for education for black people. Education is the greatest building block to escape poverty, to escape racism, to build your own future. And the North gave us that opportunity. So the Great Migration made America stronger, made the black race richer in deed and in thought, and gave this country an opportunity to be the melting pot that it is.
You might know Yellow Springs as an artistic and progressive community today, but it's interesting to note that the village has always been a bit more progressive than other places around Ohio. Since the mid-1800s, the black community has been welcome to Yellow Springs, living, working, and worshiping in churches like the Anti-Slavery Baptist Church, founded in 1863. Even though the congregation is no longer there, the building still stands. We sent architectural historian Jeff Darby over there to find out about the church's history and its significance to the community. We're in Greene County, the county seat is Xenia, but we're going to an interesting place called Yellow Springs. Uh, Antioch College is here. It started in 1850 and its first president was Horace Mann, who's known as the father of American education. Yellow Springs has a lot of interesting architecture. There's a historic railroad station that's been redone. There's an older post office. But we're going to look at one specific building that uh, looks pretty interesting. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Max. Hello. Hi, nice to see you. Well, I haven't been in Yellow Springs in a while. I'm glad to be here. And tell me about this wonderful building where we're standing. Well, we're glad to have you here. This is a uh, architecture studio uh, for Chrome Yellow Springs, and it's housed in the former First Baptist Church. So it's not really work working as a church anymore. It's, no. it's a, sort of a commercial building yes. in a historic, what was a historic church. Yeah, historic church. Kevin is an expert on the subject, so uh, I'll, I'll defer to him on uh, the history. Well, when was the church built? In the 1850s. Okay. It was built by a Presbyterian congregation that never occupied it. Hmm. And so eventually it was sold. And the First Baptist Church that moved in in 1869 purchased it. Okay, and so it's here almost 20 years, but never occupied yeah, it. Yeah, never occupied. Until the uh, First Baptist. And yeah. First Baptist must have quite a history. The congregation was founded in 1863, and its initial name was the Anti-Slavery Church. So that gives us an idea of the times. Uh, that's the middle of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. The Emancipation Proclamation had been issued earlier that year. And so that's in the name of the initial well, name of the and church. And Yellow Springs has quite a history in the uh, Underground Railroad movement, doesn't it? It does. When you There's a article from the 1890s by Ohio State professor who wrote about the Underground Railroad and there's a map that he has showing the routes in Ohio. And there are so many routes that come through Yellow Springs. And so when you look at us on the map, we're a direct line going north to Canada, really. Yeah. And so this church is kind of being founded in that, in that pathway. So if, if we think about Yellow Springs in 1863, when this congregation was founded, um, there was a well-established black community here by that point. And part of the reason is because many of the communities around here were not welcoming to black people. They were really sundown towns. Yellow Springs was not. Black people had been moving here at least from the 1850s and maybe even earlier. They owned land. Um, they were building their own buildings. And so that's the community that First Baptist enters into. Okay. And then in that community, after the Civil War, that population grows even more. And it's mainly people from Kentucky, Virginia, the Upper South, who are coming to Yellow Springs. And again, because they're not welcome in many of the other communities, they're coming here and they're thriving. And so this congregation is thriving too. It becomes a major center of community events, dinners, um, entertainment, the kinds of things that black churches do we're doing across the country in the late, latter part of the 1800s. Well, that, that adds up. Yellow Springs has always been known as a you know, liberal kind of place, and, and it goes way back into the Civil War era, as you pointed out, yeah. where the community really welcomed the African-American arrivals. It stopped being a church at some point. And is that when you stepped in, Max? Uh, no, actually, uh, roughly 20 plus years ago, the church built a new facility uh, close by on Dayton Street and the, the, the building was purchased by a couple uh, who converted it into a house. Oh, okay. So it was a house for a little over 20 years before uh, my wife and I bought it. I had been looking for uh, a building in Yellow Springs uh, to, to open an architecture firm. And when this came on the market, um, it was one of the buildings that I looked at, inspected, uh, for, to potentially put my architecture studio in. Well, I'd love to see inside. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for the information. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Kevin. I'll see you in town. Okay.
Take care. Bye. Uh, come with me. All right. So we have a couple of bathrooms here on the left and right. Uh, the original stained glass windows are still in there. I have a conference room here, entry up to my private loft there. Oh, and what a space. Oh, this is wonderful. Thank you. So this was the sanctuary for the church. Yes. It's not what you'd see in a church these days. They would have plaster on the walls. But obviously there isn't. You can see the brick walls. There's no ceiling. You can see the wood trusses above. It's really kind of a textbook of how a building like this would have been built in the 1860s. Yeah, that's really one of the intentions of the design was to expose the structure. The plaster was failing when we got the church, so uh, we needed to decide whether to replace it or uh, to repair it. When we pulled some of it back and saw the original brick underneath, it was just so beautiful, I decided to pull it all off. And in terms of the trusses, they were really what convinced me to do this project. I was a little skeptical at first about putting an architecture firm in an old church, didn't know if I could make it work. But during the inspection, I got up into the attic, I saw these beautiful trusses, and I just knew that I could make a beautiful project. Well, the trusses are, are wonderful. They're obviously very old, 1860s, uh, made from, the big cross beams are made from single trees, and I assume this was oak? Yes, it's oak. This type of wood is really impossible to find these days. Uh, and you can see from the way it's put together, you can see the, still see the hatchet marks, you can mm -hmm. still see bark on, on some of the mm -hmm. wood, and you can really get a feel of, intuitively get a feel of how this building is held up. The, the various pieces are held together just with the notches. There's no screws or no nails. Mm -hmm. The only metal in the original construction are the vertical bolts at each vertical. So we're on the, on the main floor, but of course there's a basement area and there's a mural down here. What's the story behind that? Well, uh, when we opened this floor up, I noticed how prominent that wall was and just knew instantly that we had to have a mural there. And I talked to my oldest friend in the world, my best friend, Jamie Adolph, who happens to be a teacher in the local schools, if he knew a muralist in town. And so he referred me to Pierre Negley, who is the muralist who's done most of the murals on Keith's Alley here in, in town. Mm, okay. And I, I asked Pierre to paint a mural of Keith's Alley. And, but I said, please make sure that you include the mural that has Virginia Hamilton in it, which happens to be my best friend, Jamie's mother. And so if you grew up around here, you grew up reading Virginia Hamilton. In fact, people all over the country grew up reading Virginia Hamilton. And so Pierre suggested that the murals all reflect stories from her books. And the little girl there is meant, is from the books, but it's meant to represent Jamie's daughter, Anaya. So it, there are very personal stories, but there's sort of a universality to it. Right? Yes. It's really telling the story of this area. Yeah. Well, I'd like to learn more about how the building looked before you got to work on it. Well, I'd love to introduce you to Pastor Bill Randolph, who happens to be here. Oh, great. Hi, I'm Jeff Darby. Bill Randolph, Good to nice meet you. to meet you. Thank you for uh, hosting us today. Uh, tell me, how, what was the church like when you were here? Well, the congregation at the time was a divergent group of people. We had uh, a mixture of young people, uh, older people as well, primarily an uh, African-American congregation. And now how was the interior finished at that time? It was more a traditional big open sanctuary? It was a traditional, yes. And, and uh, we, we're very comfortable right now here, but back then it was warm. It was hot <laughs> in here. There uh, was li literally no air conditioning. Yeah. This floor actually was where the congregation was. Mm -hmm. You'd come in these, the doors here. Now, would be, I'd be correct in assuming that at the lower level was where uh, you'd have what we would call, where I came from, church suppers? That's exactly right. We would have our fellowship meals down there. Where everybody would come in and bring a meal. Everyone would contribute in that regard. This congregation has always been a very loving congregation where if there was a need, and you didn't have to be a member of this church, if there was a need in the community, uh, then we would stand ready to be there to assist. So how do you feel about what's happened with the building? I'm excited about it. I'm excited about what Max and his team are doing and how they've renovated this building and uh, the whole uh, texture of it and everything. Well, Reverend, thanks so much for the information you gave me. I really enjoyed learning the story. Max, there's more to see if I understand. Yes. Thanks for spending time with me. I'm glad to be here. Mm -hmm. This is the other half of the studio. Uh, this is my partner, Steve Pitchell. Hi, Steve. Hi. How are you? 
I'd also like to introduce you to Rafaela Santos. Hi. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So tell me about the space and the artwork here. Max wanted some artwork on the wall. I didn't really understand until I stepped into the church and felt sort of the sense of the spirituality. I was a bit sort of intimidated because I had to think of how do I honor this space. I did research on the Underground Railroad, also the importance of Yellow Springs and Ohio and the anti-slavery Baptist church, which this was. There is an installation in the conference room which talks about, about the people who did the passage from Kentucky to Canada. And Ohio was really crucial because they had to wait till the river froze to wait a whole year in order to continue their journey. The installation in the conference room is really an homage for those who made the trek. So a lot of the work was created not only to beautify the space, but also to honor the people that came through here and the history of Yellow Springs. So you're the inaugural artist showing here, but how will other artists become involved? Well, we will put out a call for artists. We've formed a, a committee to review submissions and we'll, from time to time, select a new artist to show here. We really want to kind of bring artists into the space that kind of understand a lot of the area. So choosing artists that really honor this space is important for us. Well, thanks for telling the story. It's a great use for this space and I, I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Uh, Max, is our tour done? There's one more space I'd like to show you. Let's go see. Oh, look at this. Up close and personal with these trusses. This is even better than before. Thank you. Yeah, this is my favorite part of the building. Oh, yeah. Um, I like being really close to the, to the wood up here. And um, you can see all the way up into the belfry. There's a really interesting construction detail. You can see the four posts. Mm -hmm. uh, that go all the way up to the roof of the belfry. And that is how the, the belfry is stabilized by this vertical cantilever of the four posts. Uh, and that's how it's held up. And those would be from trees you just don't see anymore. You can tell how big they are. And I see they rest on this big cross beam, which gives the primary support. Yeah. Wow. Well, you've done a terrific job here, and I don't doubt that it's going to continue here in Yellow Springs. So thank you so much for a great tour. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Pictures can capture moments in history which sometimes are forgotten. In this next segment, Nicole Sutton from the Columbus Metropolitan Library shares the story behind some photos in their collection from the grand opening of Driving Park Plaza in 1978. It was a plaza that rented space to local businesses and was important to the community around it. We head over to the library now to hear more. We had a photo here of the opening of the Driving Park Plaza. That was October 29, 1978, when Driving Park Plaza had its grand opening. And we can see a group of people here in front of the stage, and you can see the plaza itself in the background. On the far right, Sherman Willis and James Willis, who are the two brothers who founded Willis Beauty Supply. And they had one location and then they started to expand and grow and they opened a second location on East Livingston Avenue in a driving park. And as that business started to grow, they wanted to invest more into the community. So they decided to expand their uh, space and create a uh, driving park plaza. And we can see in this photo here, we've got the Willis's on the right. Sherman is holding a plaque for the dedication of the driving park plaza. And then we can also see uh, Columbus Councilman Jerry Hammond here in this photo as well, uh, third from the left. These photos of the grand opening of Driving Park Plaza were loaned to us by Mary Willis, who is the sister of Sherman and James Willis. And she wanted to contribute some of these photos so that we can see uh, just the success of Willis Beauty Supply and everything they've done for the community. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on YouTube or ColumbusNeighborhoods.org, plus see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on social media. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Mm -hmm.